Hi, I'm Sam Moores. Welcome to the Car Chat Podcast. And on the podcast this week, we have Neil Briggs, one of the Briggs brothers, Neil and Ian, who are the founders of BAC. And I went to visit Neil, who is the sort of engineering side of the, the brother relationship. Ian does a lot of the design. If you're interested in both of their backstories, we've done long podcasts in the past. So go and check both of those out. We've had done two, but I had a catch up with Neil. We have a good chat about some of the processes, some of the new tools they're using. They're doing a lot of 3D printing and things like that. So enjoy. So for those that are watching on, on YouTube, you can see we're at the uh, BAC Innovation Center. Is that yeah, right? that's right. And specifically, we're actually in the innovation studio. So this is a uh, a space that predominantly is forward looking, um, and we don't normally allow cameras in here. Actually, but oh. uh, yeah, so it's a uh, it's a nice creative space. Um, it's right next to the innovation office, so designers, engineers can literally walk out through the door, interact with their colleagues here. There's various different things from colour and trim to uh, new features on the car to new variants of the car. So very much forward thinking in this area. It's a nice place to be and quiet as well. Yeah, and so out of shot, there's a few things that we can't necessarily talk about, but things that are going on and developing. So last time I spoke to you, actually, I think it was probably your brother, um, was November 2021. And I feel like you've been doing some things since then. Um, it, it's just come up to... 10 years of you being here, is that right? In December, it will be 10 years in Liverpool. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you could say we've been doing a few things since the last time we spoke. Um, innovation never stops, of course. That's that's the way we're programmed. Um, you know, I, I often say to people that it's not something that you switch on or you switch off. I think it's something that's kind of inbred in you. And obviously coming from the area, uh, Ian and I grew up in and around the, the Liverpool area in North Wales specifically. And of course, during the mid eighties, there was no better place to be with, with Chester being the home of the, of the RAC rally, the Group B era. Um, so, you know, there was everything from supercharged and turbocharged engines to both uh, Formula One had six wheeled cars to normally aspirated cars, turbo cars. So we just grew up with this, you know, in this innovative world, if you will, but not really understanding it as a, as a child. You know, obviously we're excited by it and inspired by it. And, and that's what, what drew me in. Uh, and gave me some direction in life because, you know, there were certain subjects I was good at at school, like maths, physics, that kind of thing. A little bit creative as well. Um, but how do you put all that together and have a career? And, 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 you know, light bulb moment one day when I came home from, from university and, you know, had that father-son kind of when you're moving out conversation. And, and we were reading Autosport and Autocar magazine. Used to pass them around the sofas and um, my dad said, why don't you just design cars? You know, you love cars that's your passion and you're clearly good on 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 the numbers side of things and, and that's how it all started for us um so um you know and similarly for ian you know he's got a really good mechanical understanding of things as well which is quite rare for a, a creative type and a yeah. designer type and for him you know he understood the reasons why some things are more aesthetically pleasing than others i can look at it and say yes i like that or i don't like it. i can't tell you why and of course that's his his area of specialism and his teams in fact and that's what's great about the innovation studio and the innovation uh, office is that everyone's all together you know in the traditional car company you'll have a team of engineers based in germany somewhere and you'll have an advanced design studio based in california and very rarely do those people sort of come together and obviously with this car, it's almost kind of like the artist and the engineer coming together in a way. Um, and we've got, you know, a good bunch of people um, who here collaborate constantly. Um, and, you know, when you start putting in things like lightweight materials, um, synthetic fuels, um, you know, niobium, graphene, all that good stuff, because the car has a singularity of purpose, everything translates to a performance uh, step forward. And that's obviously you know, the space that we live in, um, you know, being all about lifestyle and driving as a sport and so on, which is one of the big things that we, we're trying to get that message and continue to get that message out there. Um, and it's great that the guys can do that in this innovative space here that, we, that we're sat in today. Yeah, and it's, we, we did, you gave me a tour of the manufacturing facility and, you know, what you do here. Um, it's the first time I've been here. It was quite cool to sort of see all the stuff. And I know it's changed quite a lot. One of the things... Um, I think when we last spoke, you, we talked a little bit, you were definitely doing some of it at the time was 3D printing stuff. But I don't know at the time whether you were 3D printing stuff here at that point in time. So this would have been 
probably three years ago, maybe. Yeah, so we, maybe we, doing a little bit. Yeah, we were we were very much on the the beginnings of the journey um, of three D printing. So Mono R uh, and indeed the new the new Gen car carries over a lot of that of that learning in terms of additive manufacturing. Um, it was the first time that as a business we've kind of looked at that make or buy decision. Um, so previously, all the parts that are on the car are to our design, of course. Everything's modelled in 3D and we have a 2D drawings and they go out to our supply chain. Um, and so everything is, if you like, final assembled here. <clears throat> this was the first time that we kind of looked at the way we were designing things digitally, how we could join up the digital manufacturing process from design and manufacturing and then fit. It made perfect sense uh, for 3D printing. But in terms of the knowledge that was out there, there was quite a gap. So... There was actually a skill deficiency in the in the supply chain, which meant we had to learn it because no yeah. one else really understood it. There were some firms who do, and some of the partners that we work with uh, purely on a capacity basis. Um, so it's great because we gained a lot of internal IP and knowledge through it. What's really rewarding is is um, you know Tom Tunstall who leads that area. He was seven years ago um, an apprentice. And then four years ago, he graduated and he's, he's a senior member of the, the body and final team. And he set up the complete facility, everything from, uh, you know, the ovens to dry the machine, uh, to where the machines are based, uh, the heat inside of it uh, and the whole process. And he's that disciplined, he even gives his colleagues one floor down, you know, delivery notes for all the parts that he delivers, much in the same way as any parts that come through the goods in process. And it's fantastic because... You know, when I look at the ability to change and the speed of which change can be can be actioned, uh, whether it's for an improvement to how to fit the parts uh, better together or um, to solve a, you know, a problem that's been found or whatever, we can literally do it overnight. And that's no exaggeration. You know, a couple of weeks back, I, I walked in and there was a conversation that was happening. And the next day they were all around a car and it's we made this part through the night and <laughs> You know, it's it, it's great. It, it's it's deploying your resource in the areas that can have the the biggest change. And I th and, and and I do think that additive manufacturing is an area that we've really embraced. Um, and now, because we're using throughout the process, we've been using different materials. But because we're using carbon filled materials, carbon filled nylon, we get the structure. Um, so therefore, you know, if you look at the car, um, everything from the front and rear light surrounds to the wing mirror support arms, the wing mirror housings, the paddles on the steering wheel, various chassis components on Mono R, the runners and the trumpets, which see quite a, a large amount of aerodynamic force from the, uh, the pressurized intake system. So we're using them in a variety of applications, some of which need to have an A-class surface finish because they're on the exterior of the car, some of which need to have that real structural integrity, um, some which see engine under bonnet temperatures of anywhere upwards of, of 100, 120 degrees. It's a whole host of different environments and it's something which we're going to continue to embrace. The building that we're sat in now, the Innovation Centre, there's an area that is earmarked to expand our additive manufacturing capability um, and in addition to add a, an, in, an in-house paint facility as well. And what that means is, is that we'll basically within this centre be self-supportive for forward thinking for projects. We can design yeah. it, we can make it, and we can also supply the manufacturing centre next door and incidentally, you know, offer those services out to anybody else who's interested in using them. Yeah, it was really cool seeing some of the bits. So, you, you know, you walk in and you're like, okay, these are some of the trumpets we've 3D printed and here was uh, the wing mirror sort of support, which... If you're on the video, maybe we'll have another little video, but actually looking at the thing that came out of the 3D printer then requires a bit of sort of surface treatment, et cetera, and then these ones are being painted. I, I wouldn't look at the supports now and go, they've been done here, 3D printed on site. Mm -hmm. Like they, they just look mega, they look great. And okay, you look at the shapes and go, okay, the shapes are kind of complicated, so they've obviously been done. But that ability to make something Oh, here and then we were looking at some of the, the times on the, the printers and it's like five days or something to make something I don't know how, how long what's the biggest part you make well it depends yeah it depends on the component um, and everything is linked to the number of cars we're building per month so in other, obviously we need to satisfy uh, the cars with with parts and, and Tom by no surprise is, is well ahead of that in his planning that creates some surplus requirements, which means, for example, on some of the forward programs we're working on now, rather than making a prototype casting or bell housing, for example, um, we can 3D print one. Uh, of course, make it up in three or four different parts all, all glued together for a, for a vehicle mock-up in here. Um, and something like that will take three or four days to print. Um, 
Whereas something like a runner or a trumpet, for example, can take anything from a matter of hours. Um, you know, <laughs> great thing is with, with additive manufacturing is, is, you know, the car doesn't break down. Uh, you know, the kids aren't ill, yeah. you know, um, the dog doesn't die, you know, joking aside, um, you know, they're, uh, they're, the amount of utilization you get out of the machines is fantastic. It still needs the, the, the human being to program it, still needs the, uh, the human being to, to nest it in the program and, and, and monitor it. Uh, but the machines are so reliable now, it's a fantastic process. And I have to say that certainly here within South Liverpool, where we are, which is a centre of excellence for the automotive sector, it is actually addressing a, a skills deficiency that we've got. So not only have we have we gained this IP, which we're happy to exploit, but we've actually addressed the skill deficiency in, in Liverpool city region, which is actually quite a difficult thing, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you consider that car production has been here for over 60 years and, and, uh, and, and, and been done extremely well. So, um, you know, it's, it's a win for the, for, for, for Tom and his team, him personally and his team, it's a win for the business, but it's also a win for the region as well, actually. You seem to have, and, and I, I know quite a few of them are on your shirt, a bunch of partners that you work with is this is that quite a common thing amongst small manufacturers um i, I mean i can't comment on on some of the other manufacturers i know do know them uh, a lot of the guys really well you know because we're part of working groups and we share knowledge in many cases but we're very open about the collaboration that we do um we feel that makes us only stronger mm. um you know it, it you look at the ambition that we have um, sometimes that's mixed with quite a bit of knowledge, but perhaps we need deeper knowledge, which is why we collaborate. And so, um, I mean, it all starts, I guess, really from the digital, the digital journey and digital capability. So, you know, a high performing business needs high performing computing power and, and high performing, um, software. So everything we do is in the digital world. And of course the, the extension of that is our digital twin project, which, um, which is, is super exciting. And then from there, um, that then that information gets disseminated to the other areas of the business through purchasing and through procurement um, and so on and so forth. So we have some really good digital partners, obviously HP, Acronis and, and, uh, and Autodesk. And that really helps us to streamline our workflows. And then on the other side, we have product-based um, uh, partners. So obviously Motul have been a, a proud partner now for the whole BAC journey, which is almost approaching 15 years and 10 years in Liverpool, as we said. Uh, Pirelli, obviously, on the tyres, huge collaboration that was. And why does you know why does Pirelli ever want to work with BAC when they make a handful of cars a year? Well, um, in many cases, it's the technical challenge. Um, our car, in terms of its lightweight, obviously, it, it, it presents um, lots of unique problems and challenges. So, for their technical team, who are responsible for all the motorsport and their high-performing tyres, the Trofeo R series. Um, it was a welcome addition, uh, and that's in its that's in a, its its fifth year actually. And in fact, we have, um, as you probably may or may not know, the tyres on Mono R and indeed the new gen car are bespoke for the car. It's a bespoke oh, cool. front and rear tyre. Actually, has Mono written on the sidewall nice. as well. And we actually have Mono Two coming through shortly. Uh, it's just been industrialised at the same factory in Turkey where all the all the Formula One, Two, and Three and WRC tyres are made. Um, so it shows that our partnerships. Um, are long lasting. Um, you know, we, we tend to get involved in a partnership and it has to be a win-win. And on the proviso that it is a win-win, that's why we have relationships that are, as, are older than 10 years in, in the case of Motul. Um, and it's, it's everything from, from product to R and D pushing the boundaries to co-marketing, there's lots of different areas that we, we support each other in. And, that, and that's why we're very open and, and honest about who we collaborate with and, and why, frankly. Yeah. Well, following up from the additive manufacturing, I know, you, well, I think last time we talked about iterative, iterative design. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, the newer wheels? Uh, yeah, we can. I mean, that's a, that's a classic example of two or three different things coming together. So, um, you know, our friends at Dimag almost celebrating 10 years since we designed the first carbon hybrid wheel, um, the two-piece wheel that we have with them. Um, and then with the capability of generative design that, that, that the Autodesk software gives us, it means that we can, as we've gained more knowledge of the car and we understand the loads in the car, we can apply those and we can refine that wheel design moving forward. Um, it was first seen um, on the, on the uh, back at Geneva, which obviously didn't happen. Um, it was first seen in the press back then and it's since been another iteration there for, th thereof. Um, and we've saved another kilo, which from a wheel that only weighs four kilos is, is sorry, four and a 4.75 kilos is quite, quite, quite serious. Um, and it's only through joining all those different dots up 
of having the uh, you know the computational capability, the knowledge of the car, and wanting to move move it even further forward and being preoccupied with weight save, um, that you can bring all those together in a project and deliver that wheel as an example, and that's now continuing to be honest throughout the whole of the car. Um, so, and that combined with um, the digital twin, where we want to get to, is that we can be monitoring loads dynamically on the car through simulation. Um, as we add performance into the car or, or weight onto the car as, as a different iterations come through, through either alternative propulsion or, or whatever that may be, downforce, for example, um, it means that we can actively simulate these, these products uh, and variants of the car and we can look at how they perform before we start to commit anything in terms of parts and resource and, and, uh, and tooling, for example. Um, so it's just joining all those dots up really and, and that wheel is a classic example of it but it is it is the start of it it's been a great start to the journey and it will, it'll come out next year um, and it's just part of this continuous uh, iteration of evolution of the design um, that obviously there was a revolution that created Mono originally when we first came out over what 13 years ago now uh, or 12 years um, it's evolved and as it continuously evolves it just it, it gets more and more focused um, or uh, the application is slightly different as indeed with the new gen which is more let's say road and track based as opposed to mono while which is which is track and road yeah um, it just helps you refine the offering and make it even even better to drive and uh, like all those bits that have been changed and evolved and you're constantly working on like new designs and updating all the parts and stuff does the car has, has the car like the new one does it is it the sort of similar weight i don't know where is with in terms of regulations and stuff so like the turbo car mm -hmm. so can we talk about yeah you can yeah, yeah, I mean, that's... is that generally turbos are heavier and then you've got some exhaust stuff and whatever you've got to put on it has the car stayed a sim like the same weight but bits of it have got lighter and some bits have got heavier yeah. or has it yeah, got I mean, a bit lighter overall? It, it's a great point you make is that, you know, we have to react to the regulations that are that are in place. <clears throat> um, and so therefore that inevitably drives additional weight that the car has to carry. So for example, ABS, yeah. um, you know, there's regulations in certain parts of the world. You can't sell a car without ABS and they're good markets. So if we look at ABS and add that onto the car, that's going to add at least five kilos. Well, you have to do other things to try and save weight. Like yeah. we've taken nine kilo out the chassis as an example to try and make sure that the net net is not a significant change. And look, yeah. we're talking, you know, plus minus five, 10 kilos either way. Um, we're not suddenly 800 kilos or 900 kilos, which would completely kind of affect the ethos of the car. So you're absolutely right. A lot of it is to offset. Um, in the case of the turbo car, for example, there is the intercooler. Um, there's, you know, particulate filters. There's even bigger catalysts. There's, uh, obviously, there's the turbo installation itself. There's all the coolant. Um, so, you know, there's there's quite a significant um, weight that's been added to the car. But in addition to that, we're saving weight on in places like the chassis. There's iterations of the wheel that will come through that will save weight. So, you know, our estimations are that actually... 12 years on, the car is the same weight as it was 12 years ago. If you contrast that to any other high performance car that's out there, um, whether that be, you know, the Porsche 911 as an example, we all know that things generally get a bit bigger yeah. and a bit and a bit heavier. Um, yet the performance actually gets better. And that's the even more impressive and the thing. And all that exactly. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the emission behind it as well. So, yeah. And with the, so with the turbo car, what's the, how's the performance changed? Well, obviously, turbo cars produce power in a different way, um, and and so the you know Mono R and revving to nine thousand RPM, the new gen car which revs to eight thousand uh, RPM, you know, there's a sense of of symphony about that and excitement. Whereas the turbo creates it in a different way. Um, obviously, they carry more torque, um, so the performance feel is is slightly different, um, and flatter in many ways as well. Um, and perhaps more suited to certain markets within the world. So, you know, what we're looking to do with the different variants that we've got, Mono R obviously set the halo in terms of its appearance. Um, and, and as I said, you know, its bias is more track and road. Uh, the turbo car will allow us to enter into markets where, you know, we, we can't, there's a barrier to entry because of emissions. It's not just the engine emission, actually, it's noise emission as well really? um, for drive-by noise, yeah. Um, 
And then we've got other markets where actually we're already selling the car in and, and, and doing really well, like the US and the UK and various other different markets around the world. And the new gen car will, you know, being road and track biased means that it has a slightly different product positioning uh, and price point, of course, um, and slightly different performance, um, which which really offers now we've got a real broad offering, offering of mono. Previously, we just had a single offering um, and now we've got three different variants. And again, to use the sort of 911 analogy, you've got your sort of 911S, your 911 Turbo, and then you've got your GT3 yeah. RS. That's kind of the different uh, analogy I would I would use, um, and which is super exciting. It's opening up new markets, as you've seen with all the new global acquisitions that we've got with the new dealer network, which is continuing to expand. Uh, and what we're seeing is, is that depending on the individual and the, and the market, that there is a, there is a, uh, or territory rather, that there is a market for each of these different mm. cars actually. Because, uh, you know, very often asked question is, is, do your customers drive all their cars on the track or do they drive them all on the road? Well, the short answer is, is they do both. Uh, and depending on where you are. So if you're in the US and you're a member of, you know, you, you're fortunate to be a member at Thermal or Eagles Canyon Raceway yeah. or whatever, you leave your car there and you'll use a different car to get there. Mono is the ultimate for that. If you live in the UK or Europe and you drive to the track and then you drive home, so you're kind of a mixed usage, then the new gen car is perfect for you. If you're in Europe and you want to do that, then you'll need the turbo car actually because mm. of the emissions uh, and to get the car road registered. So what we've got now is this kind of almost kind of global offering um, in many ways. Um, and that then drives challenges within the business because we're making three different variants yeah. of the car, radically different. Um, and of course, mono is always one of a kind. So, uh, you know, our, our our colleagues in the bespoke department, you know, they, they, they always make every car one of a kind. Every car's individual mostly color and trim, but also mechanical uh, components as well. So that drives complexity in the bill of material, the procurement guys and the supply chain. And just as we evolve as a business, you know, we've just got better and better and better at that. Um, and that's where the sort of, you know, connectivity within the sort of digital world helps of going from a master assembly through to, um, you know, a bill of material that is then created into a production bomb or a service bomb or a sales bomb. Um, and we can just get better and, and, and ramp up production because that's what we need to do when we're almost at three cars a month now. Um, and then beginning of next year, we'll be up to four cars a month. Cool. With, um, we, when we were having a little look around, you showed me um, your new simulator, which is literally being built at the moment. Um, and then you talked about testing some different engine options and stuff like that. What have you been looking at? And I guess this is from like a the future and sustainability and blah, 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 blah. What are your, this BAC thinking along those fronts at the moment? Well, it's a great question actually, because since the last podcast we did, um, that the, 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 the digital twin, as we call it, simulation facility has changed dramatically. Um, I think we started it just after we had our conversation. Yeah, we did, because it was, it was beginning of 22. Um, we did our e-mono fuel cell electric vehicle concept. Um, that was a three month intensive study that we did um, looking at obviously electrification. Um, and we'd previously done two years prior to that, uh, a full BEV study, which showed that basically the car would weigh pretty similar to a Formula E car, actually 900 kilos, extremely expensive and not last very long. <clears throat> so we didn't feel as if that was uh, a feasible way forward, certainly not in the short to medium term. Mm. It would need a complete new platform, complete new, just to start from, start from scratch. Um, interim step was to look at fuel cells. Um, and with the help of the digital twin, we looked at a certain type of fuel cell and output with a moderate battery pack um, and in wheel electric motors. Uh, we put it into our simulation model, and obviously, being in the world that we live in, we can't look to bring out a new pro a new a new product at some point in the future that's slower than the previous yeah. cars. Um, so we benchmarked that around Silverstone, and we were slower. So back to the drawing board, but we can fail very quickly, and we can then loop around and yeah. iterate very quickly because it's literally the change of some buttons based on available uh, hardware, because that's mm. what the niche mark, the niche volume sector struggles with. We rely heavily on, well, solely on, the availability of off-the-shelf power units, yeah. let's call it that. Whether it's an internal combustion engine, whether it's a hybrid system, whether it's a full BEV, whether it's a fuel cell vehicle, all of these we rely on availability of hardware, and that doesn't exist currently. Um, so for us, we, we did the study, 
Um, and within three months, we failed fast and we succeeded fast. And now we're now two seconds quicker around Silverstone, as you'd, as you'd, as you'd hope. Um, torque vectoring, all those things are all possible, of course, within wheel electric motors. Um, the beauty of the in-wheel electric motor is, is that we've saved pretty much half the weight of the electric motor out of the unsprung mass in the wheel. Right, yeah. And also by using our carbon ceramic disc, which are two and a half kilos lighter than the steel brakes, that we're almost weight neutral um, by adding okay. the, the electric motors into the wheels, which is really, really cool. Um, so we're very much invested in, in the fuel cell electric vehicle concept. We believe that that's got a real part to play moving forward. At the moment, it's generally the space that is occupied by city buses, um, depots of trucks and things like that. Obviously, payload of batteries is a big issue for, for transportation, you know, because it, it completely changes the economics and the commercials around around heavy goods vehicles. If you're carrying, if, you're pay, pay, if your payload is suddenly, you've lost five ton because of yeah. the batteries. Um, but, you know, Liverpool City, as an example, are investing heavily into um, hydrogen powered buses and the depot where the buses will be held will have a hydrogen facility. And that will be the start of an infrastructure. Yeah. And so we want to be in a position where we can react as and when um, that's more readily available. One would hope that the circuits around the UK and Europe start to embrace some form of of alternative fuel, because certainly in our knowledge, we don't know any circuit that's got any electric charge points um, or hydrogen um, facilities. One would hope that they have a plan too to support to support vehicles. Um, so, so our future basically, you know, looks very rosy as far as internal combustion engines is concerned. We'll come to synthetic fuels in a minute. But as far as, um, you know, a, a kind of long, medium to long term goal, then, then, then hydrogen, we believe, is is the way. And actually, Liverpool City region as an area is, is, has an active project called the Hynet Project, um, where Liverpool's looking to make use of all of its, and the city region's looking to make use of all of its resources in terms of green energy from the, the wind farm off the coast, um, some surplus in terms of um, chemicals that are produced uh, over at Ineos in Runcorn as an example and power the city and power certain things and then provide liquid hydrogen in a green way uh, that can then be used in the transportation sector. That'd be pretty cool. It'd be pretty cool to be able to... That's it. It's, uh, at the moment, from, from my understanding, is you kind of need to be in a bit of a closed loop. You do need to be in a closed loop to run hydrogen right? because... You can't just drive down the motorway mm -hmm. and fill up. But for heavy goods vehicles or at a track, that seems like that would be if you had especially if you had a track only car and you're or a race car that you would be running on race fuel. So like you're basically buying in fuel specifically anyway. That would make a lot of sense. And then I guess race tracks, they generally take up a lot of space. They could have solar, they could have all sorts of things generating on site. It, it, it's a complex question, isn't it? And and obviously, you know, we just need to make sure that we're positioned depending on where the environment goes. And when I say, oh, the landscape probably is a better word. Um, and that's why we're keeping, you know, a fuel cell electric vehicle has both batteries and fuel cell on it. Mm. And if it ends up that, that batteries get even more and more and more efficient, and um, then it may lead how big a battery pack we have and the size of the fuel cell if the fuel cell technology overtakes the battery technology and the infrastructure as well, then we will downsize the battery pack and we'll upscale the, the size mm. of the fuel cell. So we can go either way. And that's what's great is, is we're totally prepared for it. Um, and in between now and then, um, you know, we're, we're already experimenting with, um, with synthetic fuels. We've ran our engines on synthetic fuels. Um, the outcome um, is, is extremely positive. So no degradation in power. Um, emission is very good. Um, a little bit too early to say on durability, certain, let's say, ancillaries around the engine in terms of pipe runs and yeah, things yeah, like yeah. that that we may need to change materials on, um, but not but not life-changing. Um, obviously, WRC runs on, run, runs on synthetic fuel. Formula One has aspirations to run it in 2026. And I think it's an ideal... Um, example of how the niche volume sector can be incubators and accelerators of this kind of technology. Because frankly, you know, with with an engine partner, with 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 our current engine partner Mount Tune, with the appetite they have, we have, uh, and the fuel, you can you can gain results in a matter of days and weeks, not not months and years, which is 
you know, uh, the, the realms of the major OEMs. And we can only assist. We're not in competition with any of these people. So we're quite happy to to disseminate a lot of the information that we gain through um, through these projects, actually. Mm. And is are there packaging problems? I presume there are. There's always going to be packaging problems when you've got something something like this. But with, let's say, the fuel cell situation or batteries, are there any particular areas that are challenging or...? I think I think the the, the key is is um, I mean yes is the short answer, um, but I would I don't want to oversimplify. It. That, that's just work. I mean, it's what we do. Yeah. And we've done for, for for nearly fifteen years. So that worries me less. That the bigger question of of moving from from one form of propulsion to another is is what's the net gain of of the weight? And this isn't just to focus on performance. This is to do with having to completely re-engineer the car, right? So. You know, we're 600 kilos more or less at the moment, obviously 570, 580 or 555, depending on the derivative. By the time you put a driver in there, you put full fuel in there, you put all the full fluids in, you're probably up around 700, depending on the size of the driver. Well, the net change going to a fuel cell is about 100 kilos. We don't have to redesign our suspension for that. We don't have to redesign our our chassis for that. Mm. We don't have to redesign all these different components. If we go to a full battery electric vehicle, we do. Um, and that's why I said that, that we're going down the fuel cell electric vehicle route. Um, that's not to say that one is better than the other, but for a car that's extremely light in the first place, the the incremental amount of weight that you add based on your new propulsion method can have such a dramatic effect on the car. For the bigger the bigger players, um, it doesn't have such a big effect because those cars are engineered to two and a half ton, three tons in some yeah. cases. So they can take out the engine and the gearbox, which are quite heavy, in, particularly if it's a DSG gearbox and, and four wheel drive and all the rest of it. And they can, they can replace all of that and not actually have to re-engineer the platform massively. It's a whole different ball game in the lightweight vehicle sector. It really is. Um, and as I say, you know, the positives are that we can simulate that on the, on the simulator um, and we can we can change direction very quick, which is what, you know, being a, a small, medium-sized enterprise is all about. Fail fast, succeed fast, change direction fast, and react fast, frankly, obviously, to any changes as well in regulations. Yeah. And were those the in-wheel motors, are they on the rear? No, they're in all four corners. All four, okay. So the car's four-wheel drive as well, uh, which means you can do torque vectoring, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. Can you reduce the size of the brakes and then just... And use regen? Well, you can. I mean, you, you couldn't solely go to regen, but you could definitely reduce the size of the disc. So at the moment, we've assumed a carryover weight of the carbon ceramic disc, but in theory, you could actually do exactly what you've said, actually. You could go a little bit smaller um, and save even further weight. But I mean, right now, to have a... Um, I mean, I think the total weight came out at 685 for a fuel cell electric vehicle that's doing one minute 58 round Silverstone, that's that's pretty rapid. That's um, pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and torque vectoring as well. And it sounds amazing. It sounds so cool as well. It's really, it's really, and looks amazing as well. I mean, you go on our website and check out the new section from a couple of years back and you'll see the, the, the renderings of the car. It's moved on since then. Um, but yeah, super cool. Have you, um, like with... Small, I know in certain regions they were looked at saying small manufacturers are going to be slightly exempt from some of the rules that are coming in. What's the current state of that and you guys sort of thinking on it? Well, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good question um, because it's, it's very much in a state of flux at the moment, certainly in the UK. Um, mainland Europe, after I think lots of pressure that came from the German manufacturers and particularly around synthetic fuels, um, is the, the 2030 deadline was pushed back to 2035. Um, I have to say the UK government, as far as the niche volume sector, have really conducted themselves with, with um, you know, they're very much to be applauded. They, they've they been through a six month consultation period to ask for everybody's input into the challenges facing them. Um, we had an opportunity to present our challenges, which is pretty similar to the likes of all the other niche volume manufacturers actually which touches upon the things that I mentioned earlier with regards to availability of, of, of power units and associated parts, battery management systems, batteries, all those different things. Um, and uh, certainly in, in Europe, as I say, it's been pushed back from 2030, 2035. Can't say anything about, about any what's going to happen here in the UK. It would be a shame if that, if that turned out to be a challenge for us in our home market. Um, yes, we export almost sort of 90% of what we make, but you know, we're Liverpool based, we're UK based, we're proud of what we do. 
Um, we contribute an awful lot to, um, to, you know, to the UK GDP, if you will, or UK PLC. Um, so, you know, fingers crossed that, that um, you know, there's been things that have been mentioned last week um, in the, you know, in the press. Um, we'll just have to wait and see what gets, 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 uh, gets announced. But either way, you know, the, the, the e-mono fuel cell electric vehicle concept is, is something which uh, I'm not going to say it's, it's oven ready because it's, it's not ready today. But it's certainly we're on a path in terms of its concept that, that is that is well trodden, well understood. We know what we need to do. Um, and, um, you know, depending on the timing of whenever that would be needed, uh, then it gives us an option to introduce it only if the infrastructure exists. It'd be a shame if we were ready as a manufacturer, but the infrastructure wasn't. And I think we only need to look at, at, at how successful the rollout of charge stations for EVs has been. You know, I drive, a, I, you know, I was quite an early adopter in the hybrid world of 2014, 15, when I have, I got my car, which is an i8. And, um, you know, since then, there's been a, there's been a big move towards EVs, a lot of installations that have been made um, for charge points. But it, it, it's, it's, it's still, it's still tricky. Luckily, my mm. car's a hybrid, so I can fill it with fuel if I need to, and an, an E10 now, I suppose, E5. Um, and you'd hope that that's going to change. Um, um but I, I honestly think that the future is is a mixed future in terms of solutions. And I do believe it's the right tool for the right job. Um, you know, Ian doesn't even own a car. You know, he lives yeah. in he lives in Stuttgart, comes over every other week. Um, he uses an electric car, car to go system that's an application based because for him, getting around is just about transportation. He doesn't enjoy it. It's okay about getting from one yeah. side of the city to the other, it's going to the airport or back. Um, you know, he he has a well. He would like he doesn't have. He would like a different tool for for enjoying his his hobby, which is driving. Yeah. And of course, that's what mono is. And similarly, myself. Um, and it depends where you are. If you're in central London, EVs make perfect sense. If central Manchester, Liverpool, they make perfect sense. And depending on your commute and availability of charge stations and things, then either a hybrid makes perfect sense or an internal combustion engine with synthetic fuel. So it's, it's a real kind of cauldron of, of, of different options that are all being juggled around at the yeah. moment. And you're not old enough to remember the, the VHS and the, and the Betamax <laughs> days. Um, I am, um, you know, and, and, and when the decision was made to go one way, the whole world adopted it. I genuinely think that actually it's going to be multifaceted the solution moving forward. A hundred percent. I think as as much as I can pick up from reading a lot about the various things, there there is no one solution that, that it just doesn't exist. Like like you said, with a, a big lorry, if you're going a long distance, like a long distance, and we don't have vehicles the size they do in America, that if you lose twenty five percent of your payload, which is your reason to exist because of batteries, um, that's, that's quite a big problem. And it's not necessarily the best solution. And then charging something like that, you want to charge something like that fast. Like, you know, I think you, you hear big numbers being thrown out without a lot of understanding of what those numbers are. Like a 350 kilowatt charger. I've heard of a, a megawatt charger for like these big lorries and stuff. And like the amount of power that that is. Mm. It's, it's like a small town. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's just it's, it's an obscene amount of power. Well, I mean, one thing we haven't spoken about, you know, in terms of transportation, is 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 hydrogen replacing fossil fuels, not using a fuel cell. So, so hydrogen is has been used in diesel engines, um, and with quite quite a large success. So, so that then changes the game completely because it's not about hydrogen fuel cell technology necessarily. This is just hydrogen itself. Yeah. And if you're going to solve a hydrogen fuel cell problem, you need to make sure there's plenty of hydrogen in the first place. So, so maybe that's step one on the hydrogen route. I don't know. It's just my opinion. Um, there are engines running successfully. I think there's people in the city region that, have, that are already doing it. Um, and then there's the buses and the trucks that may come because again, they have to go through their product development cycles and they're typically seven to eight years. Um, so I do think for, for that type of vehicle that hydrogen will form part of that solution. There are already uh, fuel cell electric vehicles that exist, um, mostly from the Japanese manufacturers who generally tend to lead the way, but I hear that BMW is heavily, in, is heavily invested now into, into fuel cell technology. Um, Mercedes is heavily invested into synthetic fuels, of course, um, as well as EVs. So I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, and we'll let all those guys do all their investigations and we'll try and follow as quickly as we can on the shirt tails. But it, it, it's based on what's readily available for us. And even when something That's does it. exist, 
We have to design it into a car. We have to then produce it. We have to test it, refine it, understand it. Um, and that's why, you know, timeline wise, the 2030 thing is, is quite sensitive right now, but I, you know, we'll, we'll wait with, with, um, you know, interest to see what the announcement brings. And yeah, yeah. one of the, you know, the, the great things about being your size, as we've just talked about, is you can design and make things and change stuff quickly and pretty much on site and, you know, developing a whole new car, that's going to take a while, but small changes and whatever that's literally like what you're built for yeah it is and and um you know as i say that's why we've we're keeping abreast of or we are active in the synthetic fuel world we can change pretty quickly to synthetic fuel so for example um you mentioned racetracks if synthetic fuel existed at racetracks and people had their you know customers keep their cars at certain tracks certainly in the us they could run those cars on synthetic fuels yeah. and they could do that probably within 12 months from now if if the fuel existed at the track, so it changes the it changes the the lantern of attention away from the manufacturer actually onto infrastructure um, and availability and the cost of you know it's, currently it's around ten pounds a liter, which is yeah. you know, you've got to be pretty committed uh, when you could put normal fuel in it and go equally as fast um, to to be filling your car full of synthetic fuel today but as with all these things the price will come down i'm sure once and once the infrastructure exists at the track and then beyond that um you know obviously we've mentioned the fuel cell electric vehicle stuff that will continue in the background uh, the rate at which we go will depend on where the regulations drive us um and and so as i say multifaceted solutions but yeah as you say the beauty of, 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 of what we've got here at BAC now, and we've had for four years since we moved into, into these surroundings, is, is the sort of relative tranquility of being able to be forward think, thinking and strategic and get some play, uh, plans in place for our future, future products, uh, but also focus on delivering the current product, which of course is the new car, which we, we launched at Monterey Car Week, um, which there's a huge amount of interest around. Um, and one would argue is that the addressable market for that is actually wider than for, for, for Mono R because of Mono R's performance. Um, and for us, really seeing right now with the whole EV thing, um, are people just really challenging, you know, what do I need my car for? Do I need it for transportation? Do I need it for pleasure? Do I need it for a mixture of both? You know, and, and people are really questioning what cars they've got. You know, we touched on this earlier today. And... We, you know, one of our customers, he drives his Kia something or other, I don't know what it's called, uh, for 99.6% of his time, I think he's worked out. And he feels very responsible for doing that. And he uses his mono at the weekends. He's at Brands Hatch today. Mm. Um, Robin, you know, I'm talking about you. And, you know, that's, that, that's what they do. And, and so moving forward, I think everyone is looking at how they, you know, how they transport themselves around school, run, shopping, going off to see Auntie Doris at Christmas and all those different things. Um, but also if you like driving and whether it's on track days, whether you like a mono owners club event for three or four days and driving in the Alps or the Black Forest or in America or wherever, is how do I want to enjoy my time driving a car? Um, because if that's the case, then, you know, it doesn't have to have multiple seats. It doesn't need to be this four seat, transportation sedan yeah. or SUV that we've become familiar with from this single car, you know, single car per family, how that's evolved into being so capable. Um, and that's why this car really is, 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 is what it is. Cause it's got a singularity of purpose. It's all about driving and fun. And actually, if you look at other forms of transportation that have gravitated over the years, look at, um, you know, look at cycling as an example. That's always existed. There's so many different types of cycling. You mm. never look at someone on a, on a mountain bike saying, you know, where do I put my luggage? Because, you know, that's just for going down <laughs> down on a mountain bike, you know. And, and other sports are the same as well. And um, and that's why I think the the market is, we see a, a movement more towards people who, you know, it's, it, it's an expanding sport track days. Um, and people who like driving their car on the road um as well um you know are also coming and enjoying their time with us and it's great to see that particularly through the mono owners club yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so the new uh, new car which is called mono the mono how do i distinguish it from the previous monos so mono r yeah. is if you like there's the there's the kind of sub brand of mono r 
um, which is road, uh, sorry, race and track. And then you've got the, 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 the you've got mono, which is obviously um, road and track. And that is distinguished from the, the original car we launched almost 10 years ago. Um, it's a completely different car. It's, if you like, it's the, the 2023 model year incarnation. It's a continuation of that ethos, um, if you will, of a car that looks equally at home and performs equally at home on the road as it does on the track. Um, and it obviously, we led in terms of the aesthetic with Mono R, so we created that kind of umbrella effect, yeah. um, lap records and all the other good stuff that we've, we've done with that car. And a lot of the, well, certainly the aesthetic, obviously it's different in terms of the, uh, the engine intake and things like that and, and power and some of the, uh, some of the um, exotic materials we've got on there, like magnesium and things. Um, so, you know, the, the new gen car shares a lot of the aesthetic, a lot of the engineering uh, and the knowledge gained, but is tuned more for road and track as opposed to track and road. You know, it's all about the evolution of the product, right? And so the new the new gen car and indeed Mono R has more power, it rejects more heat. And an engine that rejects more heat needs bigger radiators. So bigger radiators drives a different lower body to upper body ratio size. So it has bigger, uh, a bigger lower body. Um, that changes the whole stance of the car. Of course, radiators need more air to cool them. So the front of the car has been completely cleaned up in terms of the number of lights. Um, there's the central lights mounted in the in the front of the nose, as an example. So there's a there's greater airflow to cool the radiators, to cool the heat, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's definitely form following the function, and it's undeniably still a mono, of course. And Ian, of course, will talk to you about all the various different treatments that they've done. But essentially, it's 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 this kind of continuous this athleticism in terms of a negative space of what the cars always had, but just taking it to the next stage further. It's like the natural evolution of the, of the concept that was the revolution yeah. 10 years ago is probably the best way and to describe it. what are the it. performance numbers of the current one? Um, so in terms of acceleration, obviously we're already pretty traction limited with, yeah. the, with the original car. Uh, we've got a bigger footprint at the rear now with the, with the Pirelli tires. It's a 255 at the rear, which is, which is considerably wider than the previous Kumo tire. Um, so we've got more traction. Um, so it depends on the surface, but we're still looking at, at, at not to 60 in 2.7 seconds. I mean, it's, 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 it's very fast. Um, Monowar does, does 100 miles an hour in less than five seconds. The new gen car is around 5.7, 5.8. Um, it weighs slightly heavier because it doesn't have all of the, um, some of the exotic materials that were first debuted on the car. So um, gone are the magnesium bell housings, the magnesium gearbox casings, the titanium exhausts, um, and so on and so forth. So the car retains all of the uh, graphene enhanced composite body panels. Um, so net net is about a 20k difference between the two cars um, and overall power so mono 343 horsepower versus around 320 on uh, on the new gen car and that uh, obviously is uh, an evolution of the previous engine that was in the original mono which was around 305 303 305 yeah. horsepower so again it's just this natural evolution that, that, that that's taken place and it's a great thing to drive very compliant on the road um what's great on the track as well um depending on your ability you know it, again that's the other thing is mono R is a very 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 quick car um i think it's eight production car lap records we've got now at various formula one circuits around the world um you know two minutes around silverstone on slick tires is is very very quick yeah it's quick um you know that's like 12 or 14 seconds quicker than gt4 these days yeah without I was going to say a ton of aero. That's right. That's right. Well, it doesn't have a great deal of aero. It just has enough aero to make sure the car is stable at high speed. Um, the new gen car, one would expect to be around seven or eight seconds a lap slower around uh, around Silverstone. So still considerably quicker than the previous car, but just positioned nicely. Yeah. So still an incredible uh, thing to enjoy on the track, um, but more compliant on the road than the um, than the, the Monowar, as I said. Track and road versus road and track. And I know you're always looking at new technologies, new partners and whatnot. What are some of the interesting things that you're possibly like looking at at the moment? Well, synthetic fuels we touched upon earlier. Um, that's a big one. Um, are there some advantages to synthetic fuels versus, you know, conventional dig it up or down, ignoring the eco credential sides of it? Okay, well, I'm glad you said that um, because it's, it's, it, it's a, that's a complicated discussion. So on the assumption that, that, that it is the, well, the right thing to do, 
we've actually found four horsepower more by going from yeah. a 95 octane rating fuel to, to a synthetic fuel. There will be people out there who'll say, well, why don't you put it on 98 or 103 or, or, or race fuel? Of course you could, and we could find more power that way. But it's not about finding power. It's about looking at what we can do responsibly and what, how that solution would be implemented. Um, so as a kind of like for like, we're actually yeah. seeing a little bit more power, a little bit more mid-range power, which there's no, nice. explan <laughs> no explanation why that is. Again, three or four horsepower. Um, um, and as I say, from a durability perspective, we're not seeing anything negative really, and nothing to do with the, the, the base engine itself, one or two of the little ancillary pipes that might, we might need to change coatings and materials and things. Not, not, nothing significant. That, that's the big one. Um, I think meeting global demand, I mean, it's, it, it is a big, that's a big thing for us at the moment. We obviously, we launched the American dealers with our friends over in, um, in Newport Beach in California and Philadelphia in um, Pennsylvania. And my American geography is getting better by the day and uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, and demand from them and uh, our other dealers around the world, um, and new dealers that were set to announce, that's a challenge in itself because we're mm. growing the supply chain and growing the numbers. Um, and that's that's what we're involved with at the moment. There's a continuation of the Digital Twin project. Uh, there's the ongoing fuel cell project as well that's, that, that's, that's, that's happening in the background. Um, expect to see um, some celebrations next year um, around our 15 year anniversary um, existing as a business. No mean feat having come through a, yeah. a financial crisis, COVID, um, and uh, obviously war in the Ukraine with, with issues in the supply chain. So that's a big celebration we've got planned for next year. Um, so I don't, I don't want to don't let the cat out of the bag for, for, for another, another visit next year. Don't leave it two years, Simon, so you can see us again. That's all I will say. <laughs> I don't have, I, I could make, I, I, could, I could put some guesses out of what I, what I, <laughs> what I would like to see, but I'll, we'll just avoid, avoid all of that. Um, I was looking on your Instagram and with the, because you now do quite a lot of visible carbon, but also tinted visible carbon. Is there some t technology around that? Is, the word, the thing on the post was hy hy hypertex? Hypertex, yeah. Hypertex? Yeah. What it's, is that? Um, so, so, Fundamentally, carbon fiber is black, right? So any tint that you apply to it is going to be quite dark by definition. Yeah. So that's fine if you want a dark blue or a purple or a green, um, you know, but they're dark colors. Uh, if you really want something to pop, the actual carbon itself needs to be colored. And that's some interesting technology that a company called Hypertex here in the UK have. And the first car we've done is is what's on our Instagram post at Discover Mono, if you're not already following us. And um, and that is um, a collaborative project we did with them. And it's owned by an American football player in, in the US. And it's it's just an incredible, incredible um, finish. Um, so the carbon weave in itself is beautiful, but it has, it's, it's, a, it's a titanium color. So you can suddenly produce very light colors, which oh, of course okay. you couldn't do because carbon fiber is black. So you can't really get a yellow, you couldn't get yeah. an orange, you couldn't get you know, a nice red really. They're all very deep colors with traditional carbon fiber. So of course it opens up this new palette of things that we can do through our bespoke department. And, and that's a great showcase for, um, expect to see more of that coming through. There's, there's, there's um, some really cool, cool um, uh, bespoke custom customers designs that are going through at the minute several of which embrace that actually. Um, and then um, looking more towards the interior of the car, um, you know, we're looking at um, recyclable materials, um, leathers and things like that, um, which open up other possibilities actually, because at the moment our interior is predominantly black with coloured coloured stitching, uh, the bespoke seat and so on. But moving forward, that opens up with these synthetic materials that are now available. That opens up a whole different palette of, of colours. There's 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 lots of different possibilities happening happening there. Um, and then further afield, we've got as I say more and more dealers that we're looking to appoint. Um, so yeah, it's, it's exciting times at the minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's always cool to come and see. I, I kind of always forget, like when I got into the lobby, and there was an R in there. I was like, hmm, this is pretty cool. And you have a poke <laughs> around, and you know, you see all the exposed engineering and stuff. Um, yeah, it's always always cool to see see a mono. Um, so I normally wrap this up with five questions. Mm. You've been on the podcast before, so we're not going to do five questions. Um, I'll do a little condensed condensed version. Most undervalued car at the moment. What do you think should be worth more? 
I mean, I, I'm uh, I'm not the best person to ask that question to because I I've that was surprising. I've perhaps only had five cars in my entire life, and I'm 53 years of age. Um, That's pretty huge. Actually, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say, what I'm going to say is McLaren MP4 12C. Mm. I think it's actually one of the best cars they've ever made. Um, I don't know what they're going for second hand. I know they, they not hit a lot. right rock bottom a couple of years back, but for whatever they cost, 60, 70 grand, an incredible car. Um, yeah, I'm going with McLaren MP4 12C. There you go. That seems like a pretty good choice. And if, and if, so, if someone has driven one, if there's a car that's driven and serviced every year from when it was new till now, most of the problems slash should be will be sorted. Yeah, I mean, one of our customers who owns an original Mono and had the first Mono R, actually, he's got McLaren MP4 12C and absolutely loves it. It, It's actually quite nuts when you look at that car now and the performance and you compare it to, like, other cars now. It's still, it's still crazy fast because it has, I guess, it has the fundamentals. Yeah, exactly. And for me, from a, um, let's say, more an aesthetic perspective, I I really like the, I think the front and the back and the sides all all are all it's very quite clean coherent design. Yeah, isn't it? very clean design. Yeah, yeah, and right. the interior too. Most interesting car to you at the moment? What are you looking up? Googling technology, anything like that? Most interesting car. Um, that is a good one. Um, it's hard. It depends what sector you wanna you wanna look at. I mean, I we always gravitate towards the performance sector, of course. Um, I like, um, I'm really liking, um, I was going to say what Seat are doing at the moment, but I think they're dropping that name. The Coopers at the moment yeah. are, um, every time I see one, I really like this, the exterior styling, great stance, great presence. Um, you know, maybe the, the world champion designer from the, from the Volkswagen Audi group is, is currently there. I don't know, but that, that's doing it for me at the minute. I think that that's, and, and probably it may even be the most undervalued. I don't know where they are value wise, but I certainly think every time I see one, it grabs my attention. I think, wow, it I is, can actually see myself driving one actually. Yeah. It is a stark contrast to some other brands, some German brands at the moment where you, you see the cars coming out and you're like, just looks, just doesn't look very really great. And well, I think I think I think car ownership is about emotion. Mm. You know, if it's if it's for beyond, some people, for some people, for some people, yeah. Um, and that's why for me, I have to walk out into the parking lot and look at look at what I drive and go, wow, that, that I really like that. And eight years on, I still think I still love my the way my A8 looks. Every time I see one of the new Coopers, I think they're called now, I think, wow, cool, very nice, very nice. And and it's an everyday family car. It's you know, it's mm. probably. You know, um, not just desirable, but very achievable for most people. Yeah. Right. Final question. Five car garage. Unlimited uh, value. Five car garage. Uh, well, I remember the last time you asked me this and I came off and I was thinking, why didn't I mention that? Why didn't I mention that? <laughs> uh, and you've seen my um, you've seen my model collection that I've got I in have. there. So I'm going to have to, I'm definitely starting with the Lancia Stratos. Nice. Um, yeah. That was, uh, I actually cried when I was eight years old when I heard that had gone out of production, actually. <laughs> Um, so definitely Lancia Stratos. This is not a five car guys that you can just have expensive cars and sell and take the money. These are cars that are no, just going to stay in your you, garage. You're keeping it. Okay. Um, I would have new gen mono and that's, that, that's not just because we're talking about not, it. Not because, um, I, well, I mean, one could say that I already have one because of the bit, because of the, the business and the, the prototype cars that we have, but I do think it's a landmark car, the new gen car in terms of what it represents, um, and where transportation and driving as a sport is going and how it can do both. Um, I definitely have a Ferrari F40, um, and I nice. believe you had one. I did. Um, we need to relieve you some of that revenue and get you <laughs> finally in a mono, don't we? Um, yeah, so definitely F40. Um, Mark II Escort, um, original Mark II Escort, preferably. Um, and... Um, yeah, McLaren F1 without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I've got two, three, four models in there of them. Every time I see one, um, yeah, it's it's so ahead of its time. How Such you, an iconic landmark car. How do you or do you limit what models you buy? Because you've got quite a few in your office. Yeah, we've got several hundred in there now. So. Um, <laughs> Um, well, we don't is a short answer. Yeah. And you'll notice that the way they're set up in, in mine and Ian's office, they've migrated around onto another wall and they're heading down the other end of the office. So 
on the basis that we've still got about 50% of the office space to fill, then the collection yeah, will so keep you're going. Not, you just, if it looks cool, it's going in there. Yeah, in the yeah. And it, yeah. It, it's also quite an addictive thing for the guys in the office because they all had their cars and yeah. we've got everything from concept cars to Le Mans winning cars to all sorts of stuff. So, um, yeah, McLaren F1. I, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, is, that th is that four? That was, was it four? Did we say five? There's five. Um, Stratos. Yeah, mono, mono. Yeah, Mono. F40. Mark II Escort. Oh, yeah, and McLaren yeah. F1. There you go. Bish, bash, bosh. Yeah. Job well, done. Thanks very much for coming on the podcast. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Cheers.